Hello, so today I'm going to be talking about psychophysiological interactions or PPI models. And this is going to be the first part of, of what which will likely be a two-part PPI series. And this is going to focus on the deconvolution aspect of PPI and what it is and uh, why you might need it. So the main players in a PPI analysis are you have some seed. So the seed is a region of interest, um, to, which you have to specify. And typically, you uh, choose the seed to be a place where there is activation, which will become clear in a second. And the goal is to see how the activation in the seed relates to all other voxels in the brain and how it varies according to task. So that's why you typically choose a seed that's active um, that changes uh, bold activation magnitude according to the task because unless something's happening in that seed differently from task to task, you wouldn't expect its connectivity with another region of the brain to vary from task to task. And the target, I'm just going to use the word target to describe any old voxel in the brain. This is a whole brain analysis. So the seed is fixed, but the target will change. So you can think of this as the target moving over the brain and you're running this model um, in a mass univariate uh, approach. So what is a PPI? It is simply an interaction between the task and the brain responses. So how does the uh, relationship, I'm, I'm not gonna use the word correlation, because it's not a correlation, but the question a PPI answers is how does the slope between the bold activation between the seed and the target differ between task A and task B? So you might be more comfortable thinking about it as a correlation, but the test is only being applied to slopes. So I will stick with slope. So here's a cartoon example. Um, the reason why this is a cartoon is your task activation typically isn't um, discrete. You don't have just 10 observations of task activation, but let's pretend you do. In that case, you would imagine you want to run a model like this where you have the seed's response on the x-axis, the target's response on the y-axis, and you have two tasks. Task A is in red and task B is in blue, and you fit a line through the blue dots and the red dots, and the hypothesis of interest is if the slope of the red line differs from the slope of the blue line. And that is what the interaction effect tests. Importantly, the focus of this video is what this actual response is. What is the interaction um, involving? Specifically, is it involving the bold signal, which is the thing we measure, or the neuronal signal, which is something we obviously don't directly measure with fMRI? So how do we generally make interaction regressors in a, a typical regression model? So for example, if you have a group by age interaction, so let's just say you're modeling behavioral data and you wanna know if the relationship between age and reaction time varies by group, you would create two group indicator variables. Uh, so uh, uh, zero and one, where it's one for group one, zero for group two, and then vice versa for the other group. And then you would take that indicator and multiply it by age to get the slope regressor for group one, and then repeat to get the slope regressor for group two, and then you have a total of four regressors that you add to the model. So your model might look something like this. So I have group one, group two, age for group one, age for group two. I'm not gonna talk about mean centering or anything like that, but this model would be perfectly fine. And actually for an interaction effect, you don't need to mean center anything anyway. So this is in general, um, and the main point, the main takeaway I want for, for you to, to get from this video is that interactions are simply created by multiplying two regressors together, just literally multiplying them together in an element-wise multiplication, not a matrix multiplication. I'll get to the actual structure of this model in the next video because that's more related to the GPPI. Anyway, so what is this uh, PPI interaction? So just to define a few things, uh, you have your task. Typically, two or more tasks are going to be in play. Uh, for now, I'm going to assume that you just have two tasks. And then you're going to have your seed activation. And as I alluded to a second ago, which 
activation are we interested in? The neuronal thing, which we don't have access to, or the bold thing that we do? Spoiler alert, life isn't easy, and um, we actually can't work directly with the bold data in this case. All right, so I just spoiled this slide, but um, this will help unfold it a little and get some notation for me to use. So the bold is the neuronal signal after the hemodynamics have been factored in. So I can write that as, you can think of this as just a plain old matrix multiplication. You can get the bold, this is just a dash from PowerPoint, not a negative sign. But the bold signal is equal to uh, the hem hemodynamic response times the neuronal activation, or you can think of this as a, a function either way um, is fine. So we want the interaction between task and neuronal signal. That's what we're actually interested in. So that would look like this. You do the interaction first, and then you filter it through hemodynamics, right? So the question is, are these two things equal? Can I get at this um, interaction between the neuronal response and task after hemodynamic convolution, or uh, being filtered through hemodynamics, by taking the bold signal, which is the H times N, and multiplying it by the convolved task. So this we know how to do, and this is what we are given uh, right off the scanner. This is the, the bold data. So can we directly use our bold data to create the interaction to get the thing we want? And that is what this paper looks at. So this is from 2003, this Gittleman paper. There's one other PPI paper prior to this, but this is the one that gets into this um, deconvolution. So, turns out these are not equal. Uh, these are the things that we're interested in putting in the model, whereas these are the two things we know. So we need to figure out how to get this or how to estimate this in some way. So that's what this pre-step is in a PPI analysis. So before we can actually construct the model, we have to create that interaction term. So we do this by deconvolving the bold response to get at the neuronal response. So we have an estimated neuronal response. If I was being really technical here, I would have put a little hat on this end because it would have been an estimate. Then what we're gonna do is then we can take the interaction of the neuronal response in our task. Uh, the task we know, it, in this case, the task will just be the boxcar without convolution. And then we can reconvolve it and put that into the model. So now I'm going to tell you how we get this N, or this estimate of the neuronal response. So, you ever hear of ridge regression? I don't think I've done a video on it. I've alluded to it before. But where ridge regression can be useful is when you have a um, really uh, full rank, or near full, full rank uh, design matrix, or you have really high collinearity, when that happens, that means that this inverse is unstable, the X transpose X inverse. Um, if you need a review of where the linear model estimates come from, uh, you can look for that. Uh, I have a video on that from before. Um, or you can just take my word for it. So this thing's unstable. This is the traditional estimate for the OLS, so X transpose X inverse, X transpose Y. X is your design matrix. Um, you'll have whatever you want in it. Y would be your time series. So, right, so that's where this inverse occurs. What ridge regression does is it adds a number to the diagonal of the matrix. So it takes this unstable X transpose X, and if you add a big number just to the diagonal, it allows it to be invertible. So what this effectively does is it shrinks the beta estimates towards zero. So we're biasing the betas towards zero, and the trade-off is it's a bias variance trade-off. We trade off, um, some bias to reduce the variability, variability which is caused by this unstable matrix inverse. So effectively that's what um, the deconvolution algorithm in PPI is going to do. So what it does is it has some HRF matrix. So for example, the double gamma HRF can be expressed in matrix form. So we have our seed time series, that's the dependent variable. So this will be of length T. Um, this is a known thing, the HRF matrix. We can construct that based on the double gamma. X is a um, um, Cobringo is a is a basis set. So they use a Fourier basis set. So it's just a Fourier basis set. 
and um, multiplying x times beta, which is unknown, will give us an estimated neural response. So both of these are known, h and x are known, or at least uh, we're going to assume we can approximate them really well. And what you can then do is treat this as a regular old regression and estimate h, or I'm sorry, estimate the betas. So h and x are known, run the regression and estimate the betas. The thing is, this is typically uh, full rank because um, they put as many basis sets in as they can fit, so you'll have as many basis sets as time points. So that's why they use ridge regression. They call it something else. You can um, put ridge regression into a Bayesian framework. They're identical. It's just different ways of viewing it. And that lambda parameter, I call it lambda or k. K, k can be viewed as a prior and yeah. I'm not going to get into it. I learned ridge regression first, so I think most people are more likely to encounter ridge regression in an in introductory uh, regression class. So that is the framework I've chosen here. So if you, you'll see it's called something Bayesian in the paper. Same difference, same equations, same estimation. Okay, so first question, what if we skipped that deconvolution? What if we directly uh, created the interaction using the bold signal and didn't deconvolve first, take the product and then reconvolve. So what we have here are the original, this is just a reality check, does deconvolution work? So, um, and these are all from the paper I showed earlier. I didn't put a reference here, but it's the paper um, that I showed earlier, the uh, Gittleman paper. So here we have the original bold response in black and then the regenerated bold response in red. So it looks like it's doing a good job, um, I mean, yeah. So here is how they're modeling the PPI. So this is the task. And they have two tasks and they're modeling a, them as a negative two, one. That's because there are twice as many of these trials than these. So they're keeping it balanced. Now, um, don't worry about how this is being modeled. I'm going to talk about that more in the next video. So just accept that this is how it's modeled. Here is the interaction of the bold with the convolved, so this would be uh, convolved or the bold times the convolved task. So this would be the lazy way of doing the convolution. I'm sorry, the interaction term. And this is creating the interaction uh, using the deconvolved estimate of the neuronal activation, doing the multiplication, and then um, reconvolving. So you can see these look very different. And this is for an event related design. So I should have said that. Uh, in the beginning, it says it here. So the takeaway here is that in this case, for an event-related design, creating the interaction gives a different result if you do it um, directly using the bold data or if you do it using uh, the neuronal signal. That is result number one. Result number two, again, here's the black design, the original and the regenerated. Here's how they're modeling it. There are two tasks, so they're using this modulated design. And here's the lazy person's way to create the interaction, and here's the um, fancier way using the ridge regression to deconvolve uh, to get the estimate of the neuronal signal and then reconvolve. Now in this case, uh, if you look at this carefully, you'll see that these are actually quite similar. So the takeaway from this is if you have a block design, if your regressors look like this, then the deconvolution probably isn't going to make much of a difference. So conclusion, seems deconvolution makes a difference for event-related designs, so for isolated events. And in cases where you have blocks of trials or block trials, it looks about the same. So um, I should have mentioned this before, the deconvolution algorithms only in SPM. I have code that I'm unfortunately not willing to share. That was mean. Um, I have code from a long, long time ago for um, kind of doing this with, uh, S with FSL, but it uses the SPM deconvolution. I'm not going to post it for all to use, but if you're in a bind, you can email me for the code. Um, but then it's kind of up to you to make it work, if that makes sense. I think that's a fair compromise. I don't have time to make it distributable, but I am willing to distribute it on a case-by-case -case basis. Anyhow, 
That is it. Look out for the next video where I will go over the generalized PPI, the McLaren paper. Uses a better model setup than the paper I just showed you. I said ignore that the de design looked kind of weird. Um, so I'll explain more clearly why it looked weird. If you're like, I don't know, it looks fine to me. I'll explain why it's weird and go over what GPPI is. And that's about it. And for GPPI, well, I'll address that next time. It, it was designed for SPM 8, but I actually do know how to uh, get that to work for SPM 12. So perhaps with that video, I will distribute those tips. Thank you very much. Please join the Facebook group, follow on Tumblr or Twitter or all three. And I hope you're all enjoying um, what is now the beginning of the school year. Thanks.